Hello everyone, just a quick note that not all information presented on the Grey League channel is Greyhawk Canon. I use information from published books, the Earth Journal, as well as the Canon Fire website. Only a fraction of my viewers are in fact subscribers and it would boost my morale check if you push the subscribe button and the bell icon, so my griffins can let you know when a new video is online. You can also find me at Twitter as well as through my website. I've put links in the description. Before diving into the material, I want to dedicate this video to the late Leonard Lakovka, who created part of the Soul Pantheon, helped detail their culture, and is the sole creator of the Lindor Isles. Though few players of the game paid attention to him in the last decades, Leonard, or Len for those who knew him, was enormously important to the game we all love to play. He created a lot of material and was an influential voice in the development of the game due to the close friendship with Gary Gygax. Not to forget that he is the original Leomund and created the spell Leomund's Tiny Hut. Thank you Leomund, you will be missed. The different human tribes of the Flannes were scattered during the last thousand years of human migration, as well as through the many wars that raged the land. Intermarriages have become very common and pure bloods are rare these days, in the common year of 595. Most humans today are somewhat of a mixture of two or more bloodlines and do not have a prominent physical feature of one culture. Interestingly, a human of the Flannes rarely speaks about skin color because of this. Still, there are regions where one culture has remained somewhat pure and there are regions where one culture has remained more dominant than another. For you, members of the League, I'll shed some light on the customs and traditions of the human tribes of Urth. The old Sul Empire lasted for ages and in its very early stages were wandering related tribes who then developed city-states, each ruled over by a single noble family with its own identity. These city-states were similar, technologically speaking, to the Mesopotamian states of our Earth. They eventually created a senate-driven government that made sure that they did not war against each other. Out of this government grew aristocratic families, princes and eventually the emperor who was chosen from the most powerful noble house. Through the influence of certain elves living nearby they evolved into a more technological culture and learned how to use magic to enhance their society. Intelligence and wisdom became an admired trait and most rulers were in fact arcane users. They drove their culture onwards in pursuit of ever greater power and magic, and this insatiable hunger dominated the whole of the Sul history. The old Sul Imperium, governed by contesting noble houses, was located in what is now the Sea of Dust. It was bound by a number of mountain ranges, including the Sulhauts to the north, the Hell Furnaces to the east, and a spur of the Tirzi Mountains to the southwest. Scholars have a theory that the land was divided in the High Plateau region, with high hills and mountains covered by barren plains as well as some grassy fields, and here a series of valleys are linked together, creating first the city-states and eventually the whole Sul Imperium. The empire was surrounded by mountains, but in the west there is assumed to have been a Sul population inhabiting a river region. Here the land was green, fertile and had both thick forests and grassy plains divided by numerous rivers. Generally the Sul were living in the higher regions and pictured themselves as looking down on other cultures, such as the Bakluni. Not just geographically, but it was their vision on the caste system of the known world, or at least that is the theory of some scholars. Their lust for domination and power led them to a corrupt, wicked and decadent culture that waged an incredible devastating war with the northern Baklunish, who brought down the reign of colorless fire. With the Sul Empire in ruins, the survivors fled in all directions, many actually crossing the Hell Furnace Mountains and into the Flannes, where they met up with other Sul who had fled the Long War much earlier. My video on migration of the Sul explains the whole journey. Being refugees, 
it is a small wonder that most of them intermixed with other human cultures for survival. Pure Sioux blood is extremely rare these days, although the Duchy of Ernst has the proportionately largest enclave of Sioux and the Shalomer Valley has a large population as well, though more intermixed. Some crueler Sioux were forced out of the central lands and fled into the extreme corners of the Flannes by the invading Oridians. That is why there is an anomalous population in Hemona land, as well as in the Almedio jungle. Their cruel haughtiness, however, is now replaced by a more extreme boldness. The only pure-blooded soul that still remain inherently evil are the Scarlet Brotherhood on the Tilvanot Peninsula and the Mariners of the Lordship of the Isles. And lastly, we have the Barbarians of the Tilonrian Peninsula, who are actually the purest example of the original soul. The soul of the North and South share a strong DNA and have the same features. They are the fairest skinned of all Eurex cultures, albino being not at all uncommon. Actually, the Sul are the only true white-skinned people in the Flannes. Their eyes vary from pale blue and violet through deep blue and occasional grey. Hair color ranges in the strawberry blondes, yellows and platinum and can be either wavy or straight. We have to note that Sul living in Hemona land and the Almedio jungle have developed tanned skins with heavy freckling, although pale and albino faces that look utterly incongruous in the steaming jungles can still be seen. Although these Sul changed considerably, their hair color and texture have remained the same with lighter colors slightly less common. Sul have narrow facial features and slightly taller than the other human cultures and range between tall and lean to tall and sturdy. The Sul of the ancestral empire wore loose-fitting pantaloons covered by a baggy blouse covered by a thick rope on the higher peaks. They favored solid colors and used various emblems, tokens or similar affections marking status or affiliation with Sul houses and traditions. Sul fashion adapted to the various climes they found themselves in the centuries following the destruction of the empire and the Great Migration. Nowadays, Sul in the far north and the Thelonrian Peninsula still include white-legged pantaloons and loose blouses, but the material used is fur or felted wool and combined with furred boots and mittens. They still wear large pins, uh, brooches and emblems and other adornments of station and affiliation to their clan or house. They also still favor solid colors, having only one or two colors in their wardrobe. Only nobles use more than two colors, as appropriate to their house affiliation. Those on the Tilvanot dress according to the hot climate, favoring a loose blouse of solid colors. When the weather cools, a light rope is worn over these garments. All citizens here favored the red color, with white and blue a close second and third, but will not have more than one or two colors in their wardrobe. The monks of the peninsula will, however, strictly honor the color red. Citizens adorn themselves with all kinds of adornments of rare woods, ivory, silver or gold, set with gems and semi-precious stones which contrasts nicely with their attire, while monks keep their adornments simple, preferring white and black and gold. Worn emblems and souvenir trinkets on their clothing are considered important items of family heritage, passed down through the generations. Sub-citizens, or unpure soul blooded meaning those with an unpure bloodline, wear the same garment and jewelry citizens wear, but of lower quality. The climate of the Lordship Isles is likewise very tropical, and stifling warmth and humidity persists almost year-round, save in the late summer months when the great tropical storms that sweep in from the Olyat are not uncommon. Fashion is quite similar to the Tilvanot Peninsula, with an increased use of the vest instead of the blouse. Life on the Isles is far from easy, and a vest comes in handy in the thick jungles, as well as when you are swinging on the riggings of a ship. Within the Sheldemer Valley, little has remained of the traditional dress of the Asian Tsul. 
the organic intermixing of flan, iridium and sul in a relatively peaceful way has created a dress code that has elements of all three. Sul in the valley adopted the iridium fashion, but will stick to solid colors, often of a darker tint, and have only one color as an accent. It is not at all flashy, in contrast to the iridians of the seashore people. They wear a few ornaments, but those they wear have a heirloom significance and are thus of high quality. In the savage lands of Hepmona, the Sul have lost, over their long time spent here, most of the ancestral traditions. The Sul savages wear no more than loincloth and sometimes simple drapings across the shoulders. They walk either barefoot or wear sandals of stiff leather with some fur ankle bracelet as a means of disguising their scent or cracks or perhaps attempting magic. Their clothing may be left as is or, likewise for survival purposes, dyed to match the earth or trees. Jewelry consists of bones, animal parts, bright stones and simple metal items. Tattooing and body painting are popular, with spiral and barred spiral patterns most common, as well as body piercing. Going back to the ancient Sul Empire west of the Crystal Mist and Hurl Furnace Mountains, the ancient Sulois language was the norm. It became all but extinct after the reign of colorless fire destroyed the Sul Imperium and today it is considered a dead language. Even between the few scholars who know the tongue, it is rarely spoken. Only on the Tilvanot Peninsula, where the Sul supremacists known as the Scarlet Brotherhood dwell, the language is alive and enforced on the citizens, but forbidden to be used by anyone but pure citizens. Contemporary Solois exists primarily as a written language, read by those who delve into the surviving ancient tomes of the Sul peoples. There are two dialects of the original Sulois that have survived the times, however. One dialect, known as Fruz, or the cold tongue, is still spoken among the northern barbarians. It is ancient Sulois with flan admixtures, spoken by those living on the Thilorian Peninsula, and has no relation to common. Another, less known dialect is known as Lendorian, influenced by common and packed with nautical terms, spoken only by the humans of the Spindrift Isles, who lived on these isles before they were deported by elves in 583 of the common year. It has no relation to the cold tongue and is not written. One Sul people have lost not only most of their ancestral traditions, but also their language. The Sul in Hebmona land have a language that is coined Razul and is derived from ancient Sul, colored with names for flora and fauna borrowed from almond tribes. It devolved over time as words inappropriate for the jungle were forgotten and many higher concepts are completely absent from Razul. A speaker of ancient Sul can barely comprehend 40% of it. There remain but a few written characters in Razul, mainly runes indicating food, water and land. And a person familiar with written ancient Sul can recognize these runes as deriving from Sul words, but unable to decipher the meaning without the knowledge of Razul. They are as respectful to their gods as they are of their own ancestors. In all the lands they inhabit, Kort, Noribo and Ouijas tend to remain the most popular. But the Sul are fractured to such an extent that religion is quite differently experienced. The Sul on the Thilorian Peninsula respect the greater winter god Vatun, and give him considerable worship in stark contrast to the world outside this peninsula, where he is largely forgotten. Lendor, the god of time and lore, is another less worshipped god that actually has a strong following amongst the barbarians. Feats of strength and courage are a daily activity, and it is just no wonder Kord, the god of strength, and Noribo, the god of luck and risk, are honored all over the cold north. Because the sea brings life to the barbarians, they ask for Osprins and Falcon's blessings as well. On the Tilvanut Peninsula, 
the entire Solois pantheon receives dutiful worship and every major Tilva city contains temples to the Sul gods and every village has at least some sort of shrine honoring the pantheon. Non-Sul fates are discouraged to the point of oppression and temples to other deities in the Tilva cities are quickly destroyed by Sul priests. The gods most strongly supported by the Brotherhood are Braum, Blerg, Primis, Cyril and Vijas. And though the other Sul gods are respected by the populace and represented in unspecialized temples, these five receive the most support and fewest restrictions from the government. Religion is, however, not forced on the citizens of the Scarlet Brotherhood. A great many are content to attend occasional worship services for the gods appropriate to their current assignments, but most rely for success on the skills imparted by discipline and training rather than intercession by supernatural beings. The priests in the cities control the religious life of the citizens. They promote the Sul gods as the oldest, strongest and most attentive powers of Uth. With their backing, the enemies of the chosen people do not stand a chance of resisting the inevitable force of the Scarlet Brotherhood and its mission. When the Brotherhood conquers or occupies a new territory, priests from each of the five major fates are dispatched to these lands, along with a few unspecialized clerics to round out the pantheon's representation. These priests direct the destruction of non-Sul temples and the construction and consecration of churches of their own faith. Although the Lordship Isles are very close to the Tilvanet Peninsula, its people have more need to honor Osprim, the goddess of water voyages, and appease Falcon, the god of wind, clouds and of the open sky, as well as pray to Xerbo for greater wealth. Other Sul gods are, of course, also worshipped. Within the Sheldomer Valley, the founders of the nation decreed that sectarian rivalries between feuding Sul houses and incoming Iridian tribes meant there would be no national church. Thus, a human from a Sul ancestry is as likely to pray to Sul as to Iridian deities. That said, Brahm, Lerk and Python, god of nature and farming, and Xerbo, god of money and business, are commonly worshipped. Those who fled to the Amidio jungle and the continent of Monoland will worship any Sul deity that will keep them alive in their current situation. 